Um, Your Honor, my client would also like to make a statement. Would you like to be the first? Of course. Okay. Of course. You may both allocate. Thank you. I just, I didn't know what to agree with on the time. Either either way, either one first. It's up to you. You were your client. Would you like to go first or would you like me to go first? Okay. I think, do I stay here? You can stay there. Yeah. Your Honor, um, is there any way she can have this handcuff off? Because she has multiple pages. I'm okay. If I'm right here, I don't have to shuffle. You're okay? Um, okay. I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to. Okay. It's okay. She said she's okay. It's okay. Go ahead, Ms. Hunter. I sit here today to express my deepest sorrow for the family of Hannah Tate. Madison, Justin, and to all those affected on November 30th, 2021. <coughs> the drag me weight this has taken on my heart and soul cannot be expressed into words. Just as I know there is nothing I can say that's going to ease the pain and suffering of the victims and their families. There's a quote I heard that rang true. Grief. For those of you who understand, no explanation is needed. And for those of us who do not, no description is possible. I've taken countless nights of lament over the anguish and shame I carry, knowing what my son did, the harm he caused to innocent lives, the families, and to the entire Oxford community. I pray all the victims are the embodiment of God's mercy and peace and that he, bro he heals your broken spirits. When I was on the stand, I was asked if I would have done anything different. I was horrified to learn my answer I would not have was completely misunderstood. That answer is true because my, dad, my son did seem so normal. I didn't have a reason to do anything different. This was not something I foresaw. That was the intention of my answer and how I interpreted the question. With the benefit of hindsight and the information I have now, my answer would be drastically different. If I even thought my son could be capable of crimes like these, things would have absolutely been different. Even worse, when I learned during the police investigation that he had been planning a school shooting before November 30th. He was not the son I woke up, though he was not the son I knew when I woke up on November 30th. The Ethan I knew was a good, quiet kid. He loved his pets, family vacations. My husband and I used to used to say we had the perfect kid. I truly believe that, and that's who I saw and thought I knew. As the details started emerging during discovery, I was horrified to learn concerning behaviors my son was reported doing at school. Refusing to take a makeup test, he told us he took. Sleeping in class, drawing pictures of guns on his assignments. Writing, quote, my family is a mistake. Watching a video in class of a mass shooting that fatal day, along with internal communications that took place between his teachers and counselor, Mr. Hopkins, that he is, quote, on my radar, and, quote, he seems to be having a rough time, was never disclosed to us, his parents. The school claimed this was not abnormal behavior because of the pandemic and Oxford being in a, quote, gun community. To say I was furious to learn this information is an understatement. This is not moral behavior to us and very different than what Ethan led us to believe was happening at school. Not only were you left in the dark about previous concerning behavior, but in the counselor's office that morning, none of those previous issues were brought to our attention. I can't stop thinking, had they have been, the conversation that morning would have been much different that we would have taken a deep dive into what's really been going on with my son. I wonder if Hawkins and Ejak have those same regrets too. Instead, we are led to believe, not only from Hawkins and Ejak, but from Ethan as well, that this was an isolated event. We felt confident in trusting the professional's advice to let him stay in school that day. Quote, he, did not, he does not pose a threat to himself or others. <coughs> it was suggested that him being around peers would probably be good. We agreed. We were never asked to take him home that day. If that was discussed as the best course of action, we would have obliged. The prosecution <coughs> keeps saying we didn't give them the big picture that morning in the counselor's office. 
but what they failed to acknowledge is the bigger picture the school did not give us. I'm not the same person I was prior to November 30th, 2021. This tragedy has changed who I am and has taught me some very valuable lessons. It's said in suffering, we gain wisdom. I've also gained God. In the quiet hours of myself, I prayed to him about the deep impact this tragedy has had on the families and the endless pain no one should ever have to feel. For it is God who holds a true understanding of our pain. I've also learned to depend on him for peace and strength. Alone, I'm not strong enough. I've learned that we cannot tell or predict what will happen to us in this life. One day you wake up and everything can change. We can, however, decide what happens in us, how we take it, what we do with it. And that's what really matters in the end. That's the test of living, is how we take the unimaginable, the tragedies, the raw hardships, and make them a thing of worth and beauty. I've also learned to think, to never think this could not happen to you, and stereotype that bad kids come from bad parents. The prosecution has tried to mold us into the type of parents society wants to believe are so horrible, only a school or mass shooter could be bred from. This is a very simple <coughs> assumption to have. We were good parents. We were the average family. We weren't perfect, but we loved our son and each other tremendously. Everything we strive for was to make sure our son had the best life we could give him, to grow up with traditions and experiences we had, to be the best person he could be. I know we did our best. The love I have for our son mixed with regret for not seeing what was ahead weighs heavily on me. My point is, this could be any parent here in my, up here in my shoes. Ethan could be your child, could be your grandchild, your niece, your nephew, your brother, your sister. Your child can make a fatal decision, not just with the gun, but a knife, a vehicle, intentionally or unintentionally. If there's anything the general public can take away from this, is that this could happen to you too. The tragedy has taught me the true meaning of unconditional love as I watch my parents still love and care for me wholeheartedly, no matter what has happened. If there's nothing else I can do right in life, I do still love my son unconditionally, and perhaps that is my purpose. Your Honor, I don't envy the decision you have to make today. I understand this is a novel case, and punishment expectations are high, not just from the prosecution, but from all those affected as well. The heartbreaking journey these families have endured Hang on. I have to back up. I missed, I missed the most important I need to cross. A most valuable piece of wisdom I gain is the power of forgiveness. To forgive the prosecution for the slander and hate against me and my husband. Ms. McDonald, Mr. Keast, I have hated you with deep anger, but hate is too heavy of a cross to carry. I need to be set free of that burden and recognize that you are people just like me, imperfect. The child of God. I know he wants good things to happen to you, and in any conflict, whatever the circumstances, he is there loving both sides. To the victims and the families. I stand today not to ask for your forgiveness, as I know it may be beyond reach, but to express my sincerest apologies for the pain that has been caused. Your Honor, I don't envy you in the decision you have to make today. I understand the punishment expectations are high from, from all sides. This heartbreaking journey the families have endured is more than anyone should have to bear and acknowledge in its full death. My time in confinement has been filled with deep remorse, regret, and grief over this tragedy. I have taken this one day at a time, trying to survive, navigate, and cope with the endless heartache, pain, and grief I feel for the families of Hannah, Justin, Madison, and Tate. I have also lost myself over my son's wrongdoing. I have been shredded by the public opinion of me, shamed as a horrible parent, pained to be a terrible person. But the worst hell I carry is my own self-judgment, remorse, and deep regret. I have been criticized I don't show emotion, I'm unsympathetic, I don't cry enough, but alone I grieve. And if you were to look into me internally, you'd find I'd die on the inside. I will be in my own internal prison for the rest of my life. 
Your Honor, I ask you to take into consideration that I have been locked in a cell 23 hours a day, essentially in solitary confinement, for over 28 months, and that the court finds a fair and just sentence for me. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, Your Honor, as I pointed out in my sentencing memo, this was a no-win case. Walking, when we walked in the door, there's, there are no winners here. Every single person goes home to Agreed. And there's also no limit on the amount of sadness, grief, and horrific emotions that are felt across the board in this case. And when Ms. Mrs. Crumbly does express remorse, um, I'm sorry, when she expresses sadness, there's a tendency, and there has been a tendency, for people to say she's shifting from sadness to the victims and putting it on herself. She's <coughs> not doing that. There's an abundance of sadness. There's enough sadness to go around for all of the victims, for Mrs. Crumbly, for, for everyone involved in this case. It's not surprising that the victims have come in and obviously want the maximum sentence. There has been a narrative throughout this case that they, they believe is true. And this court knows that there is other information that was not a part of this case. And I believe this court knows the defense was hugely hamstrung, and I think the court was pained at times <coughs> over what to do. Um, I guess I'm not sure what you mean. I'm talking about not being able to call the medical professionals, um, not being able to call the shooter to the stand, not being able to cross-examine on various pieces of evidence. I'm, I'm not the, convinced the shooter would have helped you. Okay, those, well, all of those are going to be, are obviously issues, but there were things that hamstrung the defense. And I do believe the forensic records? I do believe the shooter would have helped, and I do believe the forensic records would have helped. Um, and I, I understand the court has already ruled on that. I, I understand that. I think the tendency, though, after hearing the narrative that has been made public, has been to make Jennifer Crumbly sound like a monster, to vilify her, to make her sound like a horrible mother, an evil person. And the truth is, it's an effort to put her in a category of other, to say this is not something that could happen to any of us. And it is. It is something that could happen to any of us. And people fail to realize what the sentencing memo shows the court through numerous letters of support that Mrs. Crumbly does have a kind heart. She does have compassion. She has spent night after night crying, not for only herself and her son, but also for the victims and for what her son did and what she will live with knowing he did and what she missed all the years forward. The, at the end of the day, we asked the court to look at Mrs. Crumley's role in the offenses. We asked the court to consider that while she did not oppose having a gun in the home, she was not the person who was responsible for storing the gun and believed it was being stored properly and that it was locked. Mrs. Crumbly obviously testified and all of the evidence at trial showed she believed there was a, a string lock, a cable lock placed on the gun, on the weapon. You know, I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but that, that has really troubled me um, from, from your sentencing memo because you spent a lot of time talking about the fact that she didn't know anything about the gun, um, she didn't lock it, she wasn't responsible for it, but at one time, she was texting her husband to see whether or not he got the gun and how much it was. She posted pictures of it as her son's Christmas mm -hmm. present. She shot the gun. And I don't know if you're aware of this. I don't know if either side was aware of this, but the first jury determined um, that there was a claim that the gun was the responsibility solely of defendant James Crumley. And Mrs. Crumley testified that when she returned from the range with the shooter on November 27th, it was the defendant, James Crumley, who was responsible for the sixth hour and retrieved it from the car and was supposed to keep it safe. Um, 
the first jury recognized that the GPS admitted in the case shows that even prior to the defendant, James Crumley, returning to the house, the shooter was videotaping the unlocked Sig Sauer in the kitchen of the home. So that, that's not true. That's not true. She also testified that a key to the cable lock was kept in the beer stein in the kitchen, but it's clear that the cable lock was clearly never opened. Your Honor, the, first of all, I, the jury's finding about the timing of the GPS and when the gun video was made is not correct. The evidence at trial did not support that. We know that's not correct. Mrs. Crumley left the gun in the car so that James Crumley could put the gun in the house and store it correctly. Mrs. Crumley, there were multiple cable locks in that house because there were, um, there, there was more than one cable lock. There was not just the cable lock that was on the Sig Sauer. There was, there was more than one. I didn't call him. I, there were not more than one found, but whatever Ethan Crumley did with the cable lock from the Sig Sauer, we, we don't know. The gun wasn't locked. Your Honor, jury, okay, factually, <laughs> during Mrs. Crumley's trial, it was not proven that the gun was not locked. I don't know what happened at James's trial, James Crumley's trial. You know about his statements? The gun was never locked. Whose statements? Mr. Crumley's statements. Mr. Mr. Crumley and Mrs. Crumley talked about how the gun had been locked in in all of the evidence I saw. Well, Your Honor, obviously go, we have go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. <coughs> I don't think the evidence has shown that she had no involvement with the gun. I and I'm not saying no involvement. I I said she supported the gun. She didn't object to the gun, but when it came down to it, probation writes in their narrative that she taught her son how to use the gun, and it's very obvious watching the evidence in the trial that she was not the one teaching him how to use there, the gun. There's no evidence that she taught him how to use the gun. The, when Mrs. Crumbly spoke, she um, acknowledged what the testimony was at trial about all of the different things that she wished had come to her attention from the school employees. And the prosecutor's office has said that the proposal the defense has made regarding Mrs. Crumbly is a slap in the face. And what's truly a slap in the face, not only to the victims in this case, but also to the Crumblies, is how much the Oxford schools did fail the Crumblies and all the victims. Because if Mrs. Crumbly had been presented <coughs> any of those five things, things would be different and we, we would probably not be here today. Um, I am asking this court, I know the court of public opinion is running high right now. Emotions are running very high. There are many, many complicated issues with this case. It is, it is a dynamic and different case than most cases. Mrs. Crumbly does have a good heart. This is a woman who had no felony history. This is a working mom who was, was very busy, did have a hobby. Um, I don't did, think there's anything wrong with this thing. I, and I'm, I'm just saying, largely the evidence at trial was, were some of those things. And um, Mrs. Crumbly did have an enormous amount of love for her son. And what she has painted out, been painted out to be in the media and throughout this case, and even throughout the victim impact statements today, is just not congruent with the people who know Mrs. Crumbly and know her heart. It's also not congruent with the text messages she sent right after the shooting about how she wished she would have died instead of one of the kids. I, I don't think the verdict was about how feeling she is or how sad she is. I think, I think the verdict was about behaviors that led up to that day. Well, there has been an enormous amount of criticism about whether or not she's sad enough, and there was cross-examination extensively about whether she cried or not enough on the stand or, or when during the videos that were played of police uh, interviews and things like that. And then, <coughs> on the same hand, I, when I Mrs. I don't doubt that they were both in shock. I don't doubt that. And at the end of the day, though, when she did cry, there was an objection about crying. 
And so Mrs. Crumbly from the very beginning has been damned no matter what way she went. This was the most horrific thing that could have happened to the community, to the victims, to these families. Absolutely horrific. At the end of the day, however, it's, it's a unique and complicated case, and that is why I proposed the sentence I did. I don't believe the sentencing guidelines <coughs> take into account the very unique situation that we have in this case with a young man who will be in prison forever. I'm asking the court to keep that in mind, and please keep in mind the other arguments throughout the memo. Uh, I think you know that I, I read everything you submit. I do, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you want to respond now, or do you want to come here from the side first? Um, I prefer just to be able to respond once, Your Honor. Are you okay with that? That's fine, Your Honor. Right, would you like to address the court, or would you like a client to address the court, please? Would you like to address the court, James? I would. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Crumbly will address the court. Um, for the record, he does have something typed out that I typed out for him, so it was bigger. It's easier for him to read, Your Honor. Okay. <coughs> you can't no, she said she cannot tell them to go. Let's He would, Your Honor, there was some confusion about whether or not he could get his second handcuff off. I was just clarifying the court said she cannot tell I, the I, sheriff's I office. Just, does he have to keep that handcuff off? Yes, okay. I was just clarifying, Your Honor. Thank you. Before I address this court directly, I want to do something that I have never been able to do throughout this time until now. I want to say I can't imagine the pain and agony that the families, for the families that have lost their children and what they're experiencing and what they're going through. As a parent, our biggest fear is losing our child or our children. And to lose a child is unimaginable. I, my, my heart is really broken for everybody involved. I understand my words are not going to bring any comfort. I understand that they're not going to relieve any pain. And quite frankly, they probably just don't believe me. However, I really want the families of Madison Baldwin, Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meyer, Mir, and Justin Schilling to know how truly am I, how truly sorry I am, and how devastated I was when I heard what happened to them. I have cried for you and the loss of your children more times than I can count. I know your pain and loss will never go away. Part of you will be missing forever. But please know that I am truly very sorry. I am sorry for your loss as a result of what my son did. I cannot express how much I wish that I had known what was going on with him or what was going to happen because I absolutely would have done a lot of things differently. Again, my, my heart pours out to every single one of you. It really does. Judge Matthews, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna overdo a, a, a lot of things that, that, that were already said. But 
I know the full amount of pressure that that you have on you and the responsibility that has been placed on you throughout this case. I have the utmost respect for you and I'm simply going to ask that you sentence me in a fair and just way. You presided over my trial and heard the evidence that was presented against me. You know that what my son did I was not aware of or that he was planning it, or that he obtained access to the firearms in my house. There was absolutely no evidence that suggested that. As my attorney has told you, I've been on lockdown for 23 hours a day. I've not been able to speak to my son since November 30th, and I have not been able to speak with my wife since December 3rd. I know that I have experienced pales in compassion to what those families have lost their children and countless other victims experience every day because of what my son did. But I want you to know I too grieve for everyone, as I have explained, for everyone that's been affected by what my son pled guilty to doing. And I'll continue to feel this pain for the rest of my life as well. If I could go back and change things, if I could go back and do things differently, and maybe none of us would be here today. So again, I ask your honor to impose a just and fair sentence based on the truth about what you heard during my trial. I'm asking the court to sentence me to time served and place me on probation for the maximum time allowed with the GPS tether for as long as the court deems necessary. I also want to address one last thing. And that's to what Tate Mears' dad said. It is time that we all know the truth. We have been prohibited from telling the whole truth. The whole truth has not been told. And I'm with you, Mr. Mir. I too want the truth. Because you have not had it. You have not had the truth at all. The truth has not been presented to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Stanley, are you are you are you wanting to Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. I did submit a sentencing memorandum, Your Honor. I'm not going to belabor the points that I made in my memorandum, as I do believe that it was thorough. However, I do want to note for the court that, especially in statements that have been made about James, that he lacks remorse, that he doesn't feel bad, that he's trying to put off responsibility on everyone but himself, um, that he's allegedly made threats toward the, the elected prosecutor. Your Honor, in some of the same calls that the prosecution has tried to use and has quoted in their own sentencing memorandum and attached as exhibits to their memorandum, as I noted in my, in my sentencing memorandum, Your Honor, James also said in those very same calls that he wished that he had known what his son was capable of. That if he had known, if he had been made aware of these things, if he had known that his son had, had obtained access to a firearm, that maybe he could have saved the, the four children's lives. That maybe he could have saved a lot more than that. Your Honor, there has never been a time that James Crumbly has not acknowledged what happened in this case. He has felt horrific grief for not only the families, but for the people who have been affected. He's grieved for himself, for his own child. And while that may not be something that, that is a popular statement to make, 
He's grieved for the, the child that he believed he had. <coughs> Not the child who pled guilty, but the child that he believed he had on the morning of November 30th when he dropped his son off at school. James could not have predicted what his son was going to do that day. He couldn't have predicted because he didn't know that it was going to happen. As James said, Your Honor, you sat through the trial, Judge. You heard the evidence that was presented. You also know that there was no indication given in the evidence presented that James had knowledge of what his son was planning. That James didn't know that his son had been accessing that firearm unsupervised. Or that he had access to the firearm unsupervised. Judge, you heard that that firearm was stored legally at the, the laws at the time, in November of 2021. That there may be differing opinions on whether or not that firearm was stored responsibly, Your Honor, but it was stored legally. It was stored unloaded. It was stored with the ammunition stored separately. Your Honor, James Crumbly did and made the decisions that he thought were right. Based on the information that he had, even on the morning of November 30th at the school, you've heard multiple times that James had no, had no knowledge of what his son was intending to do later that day. That even the school officials, the people who were trained, they, they talked about the special training that they had during trial. Even those individuals said that they did not believe that James' son was a threat to other people. That they had concerns about his sadness, Your Honor. They had, they had at a minimum concerns about his danger to himself, right? Correct, Your Honor. Danger to himself due to his level of sadness. That they wanted him to go talk with somebody, but that it wasn't so emergent that he needed to be removed immediately. And isn't it the reason they didn't want him to go home? Your Honor, there's some dispute as to whether or not the testimony from the school is accurate as to what actually occurred in that office. And, and Judge, I, I don't want to try and retry the case. Um, I don't think it serves anyone or benefits anyone. Um, but I do want this court to be aware, and, and Your Honor, you observed James during the trial. You're aware that he had difficult, that there was, he had difficulties throughout the trial. He showed emotion. He struggled with some of the things that he heard and saw. I and I don't know how anyone could have. I agree, Your Honor. I agree. And, and as I've acknowledged numerous times throughout this case and throughout the trial, it is an incredibly emotional trial. Um, today is incredibly emotional for everyone involved. There, there's, I echo what Ms. Smith said, there are no winners here. Um, everyone has lost in this well, case. I, I think that Ms. Smith said in her sentencing memo that it's possible to be sad for everyone here, not just the victims, but the families as well. It is possible to be sad for everyone. And I agree with that, Your Honor. Um, I did ask the court to sentence James to time served. Um, I am going to echo his request for a period of supervision with a GPS tether. Um, I understand that the court, we did object to some scoring. I understand that, again, the court has significantly strong um, strong pressure. There, the, the emotions run high in this case, Your Honor. I don't envy what you have to do. However, I am asking that you consider my request. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.